Good afternoon. My name is Titus O'Rourke and I am the Eligibility and Transition Specialist for ASI, the Office of Special Services and Inclusive Education. Thank you. I, I'm Leora Byrus. Um, I am on the uh, Federal General Supervision and Monitoring of ASI. And mm -hmm. with us today is Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Pelletier. I am admin support for the monitoring team. Welcome, everybody. Mm -hmm. And Laura, um, I've updated the presentation a little bit. Would you mind um, uh, stop sharing and then I will share my presentation if that's okay? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, to start our presentation today, I always like to get a feel of the room, so to speak, virtually. Um, so please, in, your, in the chat, if you could enter your name, the role, your school, and finish this sentence. Eligibility through, 2020, um, through 22 is... I'll give you guys a minute or so. Oh man, you guys are quiet today. I hope that's not, doesn't mean that things were a little more challenging than usual. Oh, Jen, we can always count on you. Thank you so much. I think everybody's just busy typing right now. Yes, absolutely. Oh, hi, Megan. Love it, Megan. A great thing. Eligibility through 2022 is a great thing. So positive. Let's see, is an excellent choice for my students. I'm happy to see this. It's great. Let's see. Is the law absolutely now? There are many positives um, to us extending eligibility through 22, but how we have to go about that, grappling with how to, um, as an IEP, to make this decision is a huge task, especially since we have not have had MUSA updated as yet, and we're waiting for these updates to happen. But the language around that is very clear, as well as flexible enough for us to um, provide as many opportunities as we could possibly think of for our students. Right. So when thinking of um, extended eligibility, we know that um, during COVID, many of our students, they did not have the opportunity to really expand on their uh, employment transition skills. And so with that barrier, this extension allows them that time to catch up. That's one way of looking at it. And it's not the only way to look at it. Remember, whatever decision is made as far as um, uh, eligibility through 22 is an IEP decision. So as a team, you are looking at um, how, how the value of that additional year, if it has value for that particular students. So in, in other words, is it appropriate based on um, the fact that there was a gap during those two years and you didn't have access to uh, any of the trainings, skills development, um, 
ability to really develop their soft and hard skills, that's functional skills as well. So we are not only talking about the academic piece, we are not only speaking to the um, the credit accumulation. We're talking about the whole student over here. So the IEB team really, every single uh, person at that table has a voice. And that voice is in support of the value of an additional year. Now, what I do know there is, um, we've had reports from the field that um, ODES or VR is, um, really saying that, oh, there's an additional year, so kind of kick the ball down the road. But it doesn't work like that. They can't tell you, right, that um, extended eligibility, because it's an extra year, that the student must stay. This is not up to an outside agency um, to, uh, to make that determination. It is up to the IEP team, including parent and student, to review the benefit, the appropriateness of that decision. So I'm going to stop here for a second, and I am going to um, ask you, is there anything that I've just said in, in regards to the eligibility determination that leads, that, um, that you, I've left you in a state of confusion. Because if there's a, a foundation of confusion, me moving on from this point is going to be even more confusing. So I am going to stop. I'm gonna take a breath, 10 seconds. And please, if you do not wanna speak, you can just um, turn on your, your um, turn off mute or turn on your speaker and ask me a question, or you may type it in the chat. Leah so far, great stuff. So as I was saying, we are going to grapple with all the aspects of transition, including the bar barriers and the best practices. And our strength truly are our peers, the people that we work with, our colleagues, and actively using our network of support. I, I often find when I was in the classroom and I'm working on, a, on an IEP that there's a struggle in trying to identify some aspect of that IEP, speaking to or speaking through it, with, whether it was uh, with another teacher, with another director, budget, or another peer in a, um, that also leads a class that I was leading, I found that um, I was easily able to navigate. So making sure that you are not working in a silo and leading with the position of strength, always looking at that IEP and thinking to yourself, um, what strength the student has, right? So you're looking at the spin, the strengths, the uh, preferences, the interest, and the, the needs. So you're looking at the strength and, and preferences and having that really shape how you navigate that transition plan. And, and, and so when saying that, we know that we are speaking to always thinking with a lens of compliance, but we don't just want compliance. We want to go beyond that. We want to go beyond compliance so that it actually brings uh, value to the student life and not just have things perfect on paper. Because perfect on paper is not the only need Right, we need compliance and we don't we don't want to what is the word that you use um liara when you have to, uh, a support plan no one is i'm that sorry a support plan compliance mm -hmm. yeah yes b13 compliance mm -hmm. so if our ieps are not in compliance then we have to support the school with a support plan yes Absolutely, yeah. That, and that is what I was referring to. So we do not want to sit with a support plan. So yes, we have to value compliance. We have to ensure that the way we develop that IEP and that transition plan, that it adds value to that student's uh, life and not just 
perfect on paper. So the transition aged youth were IEPs, right? We are talking about age 16 or ninth grade or earlier as determined by the IEP team. And so we know that we have a lot of students coming into ninth grade that might be um, overaged or undercredited or have had an in, um, interrupted education, whether it was because of McKinney Vento, whether it was um, whether it is because of um, they were adjudicated or um, in foster care. But some many of our students are at risk, and their attendance and therefore their their skill development is impeded because of a, a long-term absence. And so we have to be very careful on how we think through that transition plan. Because when we are thinking of uh, a ninth grade student that is 17 or 18 years old, we know that we have to uh, look at that transition plan and that IEP with that age appropriate lens. So when we're looking at the rules, we are not just looking at 16 years, um, 16 years old or ninth grade. We're looking at where that student is at ninth grade. And I have had some um, uh, students as well that are um, 15 coming into um, high school and they are so progressive in the way that they, they manage um, their schooling as well as the extracurricular activities. So as an IEP team, we can think of how to support our student now that they're in ninth grade, even though they haven't reached 16 years old. And so the transition aged um, youth, right? Our, our scholars that come into our ninth grade classroom, we are looking at, we are looking at developing appropriate measurable post-secondary goals. And so when we are looking at appropriate measured post-secondary goals, we know that it has to be um, updated annually and that we are not repeating the same goals over and over again. Nor are we um, having that student complete the same assessment tool over and over again. We need to look at that student, where they are at, the, the age that they are at, and their strengths and preferences. And we are going to build a transition plan as we build those, oh, we build the tra uh, transition assessment plan, which, in, which will inform our transition plan. So those, those factors is very important. You just don't assume that they are ninth grade and you can start and have a standard set of um, transition assessments for every student uh, for those four years. We have to look at ninth grade and think to ourselves where he is at right now. So if he's coming in at 16, we know his levels um, uh, are very low and these needs are very complex. So as a team at ninth grade, are we thinking about, mm, he might benefit from an additional year or two to further develop his functional skills? And this is a conversation that you're going to start at ninth grade. I know we've been thrown in head first and we had to swim through uh, with the administrative letter, which is the right thing to do, allowing our students that had been, that the, uh, that the pandemic had really um, created hurdles in their life and access to employment and post-secondary opportunities. So we know this is such a valuable opportunity, this, ex, um, this additional year to 22. But at the same time, not all students need that. So we are not going to, as we know, it's an IEP, an individualized education plan. So we want to make sure that our assessments are individualized, the way that we plan for the transition goals and service, services are also individualized. So annually updated is very important, not just copied and pasted annually updated with an assessment tool that speaks to that update. Ninth grade, they want to chase goats. Tenth grade, they decided, no, they want to own a goat farm. Eleventh grade, they might decide, okay, no, they want to follow a veter veterinarian tract or work with animals. 
whether their grades match that um, is not what we are questioning over here, but we are, we realize that a career cluster and the skills around that career cluster that can support your student post-secondary. So it's not identifying necessarily a specific job. What we are trying to do is to prepare them for the industry and prepare their soft skills and hard skills post um, for their post-secondary journey within that career cluster that they have um, shown interest or the assessments based on the assessments it had gleaned an insight into the the students strengths and preferences and we know that we are dealing with teenagers and they are fickle and they change their mind every 10 minutes but we need, that's why I'm saying by looking at career clusters and their strengths versus trying to identify a job or identify, oh, they have to go to vocational, or they have to go to college, or they have to go to um, university. What it is, is how can we prepare them so that they're ready for the opportunity that awaits them um, when they've rolled up their sleeves and really started um, looking at their next steps for post-secondary, so preparing them for their journey. So. I said again, the annual updated goals based on age appropriate transitions. We're looking at these transition services, ninth grade. So ninth grade, they come in. We do know VR counselors can do pre-ETS uh, services for our students in ninth grade. Used to, in years before, we'd um, have to have a parent consent to do the pre-ETS uh, skills, but VR counselors can come into the school, they can actually lead these particular lessons. So this is, and they do the instruments, um, the assessments uh, with the students as well. And they have a big curriculum on pre-ETS. Now, I, I said that, in, that we used to have to have parent consent. I still I would always err on the side of caution. I would ask my VR counselors for that consent form if they still use that consent form, and I would send it home with every single ninth grader. And I would make, um, I would um, contact my VR counselor, and I would have develop a plan, a pre-TS development plan with your VR counselor, and they can actually lead this. Every Friday, every Friday morning they come in, they work with other different group of students, or if you have a small school, work with the same group of students and work out a timeline and time frame to do that. Number one, your transition assessment is being done in that classroom. So you're taking less, so by uh, including VR in this journey, you are also supporting um, development of that IEP. Because you now know not, you do not have to do separate assessments. You can take that transition portfolio being developed with that VR counselor in that particular class, and that can inform your IEP uh, transition plan and your IEP in general. So, so now we have the VR counselor, and he's working or she's working, and uh, with um your ninth graders oh another resource goodwill does this as well goodwill and if you want any of these resources just put your name in the chat and i'll collect it and i'll send all these resources to you as well i have a few in this presentation but as i'm speaking to these topics it's just pop bubbling to the top again so please Titus, just in the, hmm? can yes. i ask you a quick question go for it what should districts do if they um, if they can't get in touch with the VR counselor or they don't know who their assigned VR counselor is? Write me, call me, send me a message in a bottle, and I will make sure that a VR counselor contacts you. So, other than that, when if you have your list if you have the list of vr counselors for the state of maine and you're unable to contact that vr counselor there's a regional 
a regional lead VR counselor, and they are supposed to help you virtually, right? Because your uh, local one can come into your school. The VR one will help you virtually. But if no one's answering you, let me know and I will go from the top down for you. Thank I think you. I have, I just this morning, I received an updated list for the VR counselors. So again, put your name in the chat if you want me to send anything to you. And I will make sure to send every single resource that I'm speaking to um, to you after our time together. Sounds so uh, close, so intimate, and yet it's all virtual, right? So um, let me see, where was I? Okay, so looking at these transition assessments, we must, and I, and I must um, reiterate the value and the priority of these transition assessments and the course of study, especially when it relates to extended eligibility. And it's not extended, it's eligibility through 22. And I think I'm going to reframe the way we speak about it because, you know, it's, it sounds as if we are asking you to do additional work when all this is, is really just planning out in support of the student. So making sure that um, as we think, think through the transition assessments, we're looking at the course of study. Is the course of study going to be a four-year plan? Is it a five-year track? Is it a six-year track? Which electives can you look at um, to help uh, speak with a guidance counselor, speak with their counselor, and see which electives would best support the development of skills that the student have, um, through the assessment tools, have, um, have shown interest in? So that assessment, these assessments do not only um, inform the goals and the academic goals. It also informs the course of study and the electives that will be selected in support of that post-secondary goal that the student is moving, um, is planning towards, or we're helping them plan towards. So, <laughs> Hold on, I'm trying to. Let me see what didn't I mention over here. All right. Any questions so far? I don't see any in the chat. Anybody want to just unmute and ask me a question? Um, no. Okay. So considering this eligibility, um, considering extending eligibility through 22. When the students are provided with experiential learning um, and activities, the learning is more meaningful, specific, and applicable. And the ability to articulate learning becomes more natural. So the more the student is participating in these skills, the really the ability to express themselves and um, develop their skills, it's, it becomes more proficient. So trying to develop opportunities for our students to explore the advantages of uh, project based learning. So when we're talking about transition, we're talking about assessment. We are looking at formal and informal opportunities for our students to grapple with these transition skills. And one way of doing that is by developing project-based learning opportunities, scenario-driven mo modules, right? And um, authentic assessments that helps can really develop and construct that um, transition portfolio, and then it helps us contextualize learning around career readiness for that student. So we are not just taking a piece of paper. What I'm saying is, please don't just take a piece of paper, put it in front of the student and have him fill it out. Look at the, the all the factors surrounding um, 
the learning opportunity for that student. So when we are talking about experiential, we want them to be able to grapple with an, um, a topic, whether it's through discussion, whether it's physically doing it, whether it's an, um, a project-based learning, where they're working in teams, looking at um, scenario-driven um, role-play activities, um, in the classroom as well, so that it not only uh, further develops their communication skills, but interaction within team collaboration. So the more our students are included in these act activ activities, we are um, increasing opportunities for them to develop their uh, soft and hard skills that will get them career ready. And at the same time, so speaking about career readiness, we also know that with our students, especially with um, complex needs, we need to ensure that we're looking at, um, that we are prioritizing their functional skills as well. So we're talking about the transition, we're talking about academic, and now we have to make sure that our lens also focuses on life skills. So this helps the students with many different types of disabilities, but generally those who need the support, like all round support, um, especially when it comes to behaviors. And I'm not just talking about negative behaviors. I'm talking about uh, routines, um, coming into the classroom, realizing that they need to take their pen out, they have their book, that um, there's a structured way that the the class or the project um, is planned for so that they build around organization and time management. So again, assessment is not just about the academic piece. It's not only about the uh, transition goals, but it's also getting that student ready to interact in the real world. It's also teaching that student how to be accountable for um, what is needed, whether it is asking for an extension, um, time extension to complete um, whatever activity it is that you have assigned to them. Teaching them how to ask for help, how to self-advocate, how to communicate their needs through their functional skills will secure, will further secure their readiness, their post-secondary readiness. And again, I'll take a moment and ask if there's any questions or any wonderings or comments on what I've just said or shared with you guys. Okay, moving on. Now that my mouse. I wanted to make, there was a few questions that have come to me several times over and over again. People emailed me asking me particular questions and I thought that the most asked questions I will discuss with you guys over here. So we're looking at if a student receives a certificate of completion, could they come back? And the answer overwhelmingly is yes. The main Department of Education, right, with that administrative letter, they have concluded that terminating eligibility for FAPE, uh, the free appropriate public education, at the end of the school year in which the student turns 20, is inconsistent with IDEA. And that was based on the first court, the first circuit ruling, um, KL versus Rhodes. I should know this. It's It's been in my nightmares. So I should be able to like cite case law verbatim. So yeah, so the first circuit was KL versus Rhode Island. And, um, and now we are following instead of waiting for the courts to tell us, Maine wants to be on the front line of this. So the answer again is overwhelmingly yes. The student with a disability is eligible for FAPE until they graduate with a regular diploma. So, 
So again, but once they have that regular diploma, there's no, what is it? No take back seats. We have to ensure that um, that is understood. If we are graduating that student with a, uh, with a high school diploma, there is no coming back. That's when FAPE ends for them. That's when all services that was provided um, during their high school years, that's when it ends. So our students with complex needs, we do know that, um, and again, I said that um, VR, Department of Labor, Vocational Rehab, ODES, DHHS, they cannot tell us that they want to kick the ball down the road and we should keep our student, right? But with that same measured tone, we need to look at the the, 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 the value we can add to that student's life. By graduating, by um, determining them eligible to graduate with a high school diploma. So that's a heavy decision to be made because we know that now that they graduate, these students, we are hoping that the system is in place to support them. But we also know the wait list with OATS. Some people, because of the priority level that the students are placed on, I'm not sure if you guys um, know about the priority levels. So based on the, the urgent need of the student, they will place them in a priority list and only the first priorities will be addressed and, and, and access to services. Everybody else sits on a waiting list. And I've heard of waiting lists up to six, seven years. And yes, we are now working to address this, but this is where it's at right now. So I also want us to be very conscious. We are not babysitters. We can't keep them for that particular reason, but we also have to be cognizant of what lies, um, what is there for them after they graduate. No comment on any questions or comments regarding this. I know this is a really emotional thing for me because um, I've seen how it works and I see how it does not work. And so I'm advocating for change behind the scenes, um, scenes over here. But I, I don't know if my passion for what I do is just coming, is just spilling over, but I also want to make sure that it is understood. We are not babysitters. We can't keep the kid just because the adult agencies decide that they can't help them right now. But we have to be very measured in how we support our students. Okay. Question number two. Does anyone want to read that for me? And then I'll speak to it. Would you like me to, Titus? I was speaking. Um, I don't know. I was naturally looking at it. Mm. Oh, go for it. Okay. Does this mean a child can attend until June 30th of the school year or their actual 22nd birthday? So, it's the same rule that applied um, for um, when the student went to school up to age 21. It was like the day before, right? He turned 21 or she turned 21 that we, um, that state ended for them. And this is the same rule, but now just till 22. So in the same manner as you would have addressed a student, a student um, aging, aging out at the age 21, you are going to do the same thing for that student at age 22. So there's nothing different or separate. It's only an added year. So the way IDEA um, speaks to it is between the ages of three and 21 inclusive. So everything that is in 21, but nothing at 22. Okay. 
And the next question. Does this mean, okay, go for it, please. Leora. Okay. Does this mean that a child can attend until June 30th of the year or their actual 22nd birthday? Oh, sorry. That's the same question. I didn't move forward. My apologies. There we go. All right. What about the student? What about the student that has credits for a diploma but has not met functional goals? And and here is what I was speaking to earlier, right? The student has all their academic credits. But during the pandemic, they were sitting at home and they were on and then we know. Even our general education students have regressed in many of their skill development. So we can only imagine what that means for our students with complex needs and the regression and the support they need to catch up, right, or redevelop the skills that um, faded or dissipated during the pandemic. So we have to look at the credit accumulation, the transition goal attainment, and the functional skill development. And we're looking at all of three, all the, these three aspects in a metered way to ensure that the student is actually ready to graduate. Now, I've been working on a graduation tool. Um, however, we have a bill going through in the next week. What is it now, um, Liar? I'll D98. Is that it? Or 38? I, <laughs> I, I think 98. It's, it's 98. Nine, it's 98. Yeah. It is 98. Very good. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> that is very helpful. So with that, the, the language is going to be set for us. And once we have those, because I didn't want to have the graduation tool out there, and then the language changes, and then everything that we've done, we have to redo. Is there a written document outlining country for extended eligible? I have that, Robin. I do have that. But let me say again, when I um, was ready to release this, I found out about LD98 and I found out at the fact that they could change the language. And if the language changes and I've given you directives based and outlining the criteria and they change the language, it's going to create chaos. So the tool is ready. Once I have a rubber stamp on LD98, I can release this tool. And then we can all start using it and push back and, and, and editing it or however it's applicable. But for right now, we just have to fall off and I can only tell you what you can do verbally versus give you the written document. And I, I know that's not the response that you guys necessarily want right now because it's a year later, right? We should be ready with, with this, but we've had to uh, ensure that the language is confirmed before we are facing a lot of due process. But let me tell you what you can include, right? On at a very high level. First and foremost, that Liara ate the um, written notice. It's not prior written notice in Maine, it's advanced written notice. Am I correct, Liara? So the, the advanced written notice is what um, goes out to schedule the meeting. The written Ooh. notice is what details everything that happened. Mm -hmm. So in the first, so the um, AWN and then the WN, the written notice. In the AWN, you make sure that you list the fact that you are going to speak to the um, eligibility through 22 and the discussion and all the factors that you are going to discuss um, that relates to the eligibility extended year that you want to discuss with the parent. And then in the written and, and very detailed 
um, about what, um, how you are going to make this determination clearly in the AWM. And then on the other side, on, at the end of the meeting, your written notice that goes out confirms everything that was discussed. And you're making the notes, the pros and cons that was for um, the extension, the cons that's against, what the parent decide, what the parent expressed, what each of the, the, the IEP team members expressed based on the discussion topics that you've listed in the AWM. You also making sure that your course of study in that IEP, if there's an extended year, an, an additional year added, that your course of study also reflects that. So example, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, you might not do it by grade, but then you do it by year, right? First year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year, or you could do it, how did you, we discussed this, Leora, we said 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and mm -hmm. then um, and then how do we, what's the, 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 the way that they'd write the fifth year? So um, what we're seeing in IEPs that seems to work out really well is doing it by the year, like 21, 22, 22, 23, 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And that way they're not being, um, you know, labeled with freshman, um, sophomore, et cetera, that you have to kind of come up with something for that fifth or sixth year. Mm-hmm. But that's not set in stone. So if there was another way that people wanted to label those years, we're certainly open to that. Mm -hmm. So we are identifying best practice at this point, mm -hmm. right? That yeah. is the course of study. But make sure that that course of study is also, um, you have a narrative in the pl plasp, in the plop, that you have a narrative speaking to um, why these decisions were made or how it will benefit the students as well. So not just putting that in the course of study, but making sure in the narrative that you are I, I, identifying, sorry, uh, that you are, um, that you are um, detailing the course of study recommendation. Titus. Mm -hmm. We look for that conversation um, because it is part of the indicator in the written notice. Mm -hmm. Yep. So AWN and written notice. Course of study, making sure that it's also detailed over there. Now, if the parent decides that they want the student to stay, but the IEP team determines that it's not needed or not necessary. We have to make sure that if that parent decides to go to due process, that we have our ducks in a row, that we've detailed the AWN, that the discussion with the parent, we detailed everything that was said during that meeting in that written notice. We have our course of study over there. We have appropriate age um, age appropriate assessments that can speak to the determination of the goals and the related academic goals to support the transition goals. So when we have when we have all of that in a row, even if a parent goes to due process because that's their right, there's nothing we can do. But we, we do know that we have a well-developed IEP, we have very strong, strong written notice, and we have the notes to back that up. Do you have any additional comments and, and, and or, or suggestions for them on this bit, Liara? No, I don't. I think you've articulated it very nicely. Thank you. Any questions on this? Is there a written? Nope. It's the left. All right. Moving on. So, turning 22. I think I have a question. Go for it. So, once we get past um, the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, are we looking at more functional life skills transition goals and not so much the academic goals, or would we still want to include those in the IEP as well? Oh, all those goals have to be included 
but we are weighing the um the when we are looking, for example, at a student that's right now in 11th or 12th grade, right, and we see that they have attained, based on their IEP academic goals, that they've attained their credits for their classes, but you do see that they are still struggling to communicate. You do see that they are struggling to self-advocate, that you do see that um, they show up late, not because they didn't plan to, but they're walking around and they, they really don't know how to um, manage their time because that quick conversation turns into, you know, the chatterboxes and they're like, oh, miss, I forgot, I didn't see. So looking at all of these skills that would benefit, it really, it has to be uh, appropriate for that student to suggest and, um, you know, for the IEP team to talk about that additional year. It has to be appropriate for that particular student. And you cannot use the same brush for each and every student, right? So um, I had a student with significant needs, but he was always the first one there. He had his book out, his pen out, he was ready to go. Then I had higher level students that would turn and, you know, chatterboxes, et cetera. But when they got down to it, they could do the work but they needed other development areas to be addressed. Did I, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. My pleasure. I so, have a question, Titus. Go for it. Um, it's kind of twofold. One in that um, if you have a student with significant needs mm -hmm. um, and they, uh, this particular student I'm thinking of is currently in their fifth year, Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like they'll there would always be a case to be able to be made that that student needs to continue to work on this skill or that skill, but that those might be lifelong uh, learning opportunities for that student well beyond um, high school and that they may need support going forward in that avenue consistently. Um, that's my first sort of part of this question. And then the second part of this question is, um, does the criteria change after they've had an additional year to talk about whether a sixth year, um, particularly when parents really want the child to stay in high school because they've been supported so well and it's their community and there isn't anything out there right now because the student is very involved um, I think in my district, we're struggling to narrow down that criteria. We also know that we have very young um, students coming up next year that will negatively impact this student, even though we're keeping them in separate programs. It's mm -hmm. a small school. So yes. those things are weighing on us. So this is what I would, what I would how I would look at this, right? The language of the law doesn't require the student to be in the classroom whole day. Remember, we can think of partial days. We can look at job opportunities in the community. We can look so it could be partial days or only one or two days. We could look where the student just checks in and then goes to his job program whether it's working in the cafeteria at the school, whether um, it is a community job or a job shadow um, um, in the community. There's not just one way of looking at that additional year. So looking at that student and looking how work experience or looking at how job shadowing or looking at partial days because he's still in school and so you're addressing the students um the the parents worry about access to services but you're also addressing the fact that you know those younger kids are going to not necessarily be the best influence for that particular student Right. And so, that's what this current year's program has looked like for the student. He's out mm -hmm. in the community. We're taking him to job experiences and job shadowing and um, those kinds of opportunities. And to be honest, we could continue doing that for a very long 
time, but we we also feel like it's all, it's time for the student to move on to new experiences. Um, and mm -hmm. we're just not sure we can document it in a way that is, we're just stuck. Okay, so you had that conversation with mom and we you've had that AWNM and the rigid gnosis and this has been discussed in the previous IEP that you are extending um, the year and the student is going to participate in a partial day program um, leaning into their career development. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what he's done this year, although it is a full day. It's part oh, this of this is a full day. Yeah, he's here. He's at our school the full day and he goes and does job opportunities and life skills opportunities um, within that full school day. And this is his fifth year. Mm -hmm. An IEP decision. That is truly an individualized. And remember, you don't have to do the full day. You can offer partial. So you know how we speak to um, supported employment, where the student has a job coach that goes with them to the job site, and then slowly we, we start pulling away for total independence. I think so, thinking around that on how this year he's been fully supported, right? fully supported in the classroom and fully supported at the job site. If we can take that support away from school and just have him check in, whether it's before reporting to the job site or just after, uh, however the programs work, because it's all logistics. So logistically, what would be more feasible, but then try to extend his time at the job site and do less at school. And if, you know, you've done what you could and you've documented and you dotted your I's and crossed your T's and your, and your IP has been well developed, if his time is up, his time is up. And our, we, we want our parents to buy in to the decision made by the whole team, but that's not always going to happen. And when that happens... I have to say this out loud, and I know I've said it twice so far, but the parent has the right to due process. But the fact is, if you know you've done all that you can do, and then you've documented that I, um, everything you've done in that IEP, then it's, there's nothing further that you can do for that student. And they are going to be parents that's going to push back hard. But I, I have to reiterate, we, we can't babysit. We have to add value to that student's life. And um, I would make sure that um, your VR counselor, that he's completed his uh, eligibility form. You also should take a, an opportunity to uh, double check whether he's applied for his waiver services where in that process that that wave assist uh, services is. So trying to connect your OCFS, um, the services that he had under child services, and trying to bring ODES and OCFS to that IEP meeting. Okay, so we can also reach out to me individually so that I can look at the information individually on that IEP as well and support you that way. And anyone um, um, at today's PD, if there's a specific case that you would want to talk through, or think through, or, you know, um, more minds are better than one, um, please just reach out to me and we can set a time and we can grapple um, together. Um, oh my goodness, it yeah, is 356, yes, there's so much more that I want to share, but I'd rather do, um, do depth than just, you know, the breadth of it, because there's a, a lot to consider when thinking um, extended eligibility, but the first thing that we need to understand is that what we are thinking about is providing a student an opportunity that has had interrupted um, services 
and academic access, and that's the pandemic. So that is what we are doing when we are thinking about extending the students' time at the school. We need to know that the reason that we are doing it is going to be beneficial for that student. Again, no babysitting. We do know that we want to address specific readiness skills. We want to know how we're going to do it, and we want to know how it relates to um, his post-secondary success. And then the how. There are so many ways that we can address how. Um, up to the age of 22. Again, we can think of partial days. We can think of um, job programs. We have goodwill as well, people. Goodwill is a very good source um, for especially students with complex needs in providing part-time employment. VR pays the student through the goodwill job sites. So this is something a student can do as well. It's very empowering. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to mention is that to leave with the facts of eligibility through 22. So there's two ways in which the discussion of determination of eligibility can occur. Number one is through the IEP team and the other when the parents and districts agree in writing to meet without convening the full IEP. So again, the formalized structure of the IEP and then your um, advanced written notice and your written notice that's followed. Remember, focus on their course of study as well. And then number two, you can have an informal discussion with that parent as well. Ask for the IEP to convene, but not as in a formal IEP meeting, but just to weigh out the pros and cons. Sometimes in a less structured way, a parent will be more open to listen. And we are at time today. Um, what I wanted to share with you guys is my um, transition survey, please. Please complete the transition survey and you will receive contact hours for today's PD. For additional questions, um, I am going to I'm out of the, oops, there we go. I'm going to come out of that now for any additional questions uh, or if you want to meet individually to review any of this, any that I said today or anything in addition. Um, where's the chat? There we go. That's my information that I plucked in the chat. So the survey. Well, once you submit that survey, you will receive your contact hours for today's PD, as well as my contact information, and I can work one-on-one -on -one with a case manager, with a district school team, um, or any format, whether you need me to come in person, whether you want to do it uh, virtually, I'm available to support um, anything in regards to transitional eligibility. No task too small, no mountain too high. Titus, Julie is going to get you the list of folks who registered. So you have everybody's um, email to send out the um, the goodies that you have to share with folks. So okay. it'll be sort of a universal sharing with everybody who registered, if that's okay with you. And she'll get that, that to you perfectly. tomorrow. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us for Office Hours today. Next week, we're talking about multilingual learners and mm -hmm. going over the new guidebook that Maine released in the fall about identifying multilingual learners with special education. So thank you all very much, and I hope you all have a great rest of your night or day. Thank you, everybody.